There used to be a time when the MacBook was indisputably one of the best laptops that money could buy. But unfortunately, for the last few generations of MacBooks, that has not been the case. You've got to go all the way back to 2015 to get what I consider to be a decent MacBook. So it has an aluminum enclosure, just like this MacBook and all the generations since then. Uh, but the I.O. was actually pretty decent. You had two USB ports, two Thunderbolt ports, an HDMI port, a headphone jack, an SD card slot, and a MagSafe 2 charger, which is a pretty cool power connector. And it was also the last MacBook Pro that you could easily upgrade the RAM and storage on yourself. But since then, all of the MacBooks have been kind of crap. First, Apple got the bright idea to take away the ports, starting with the 2016 MacBook, which only had four USB-C ports. They decided that I.O. variety would be a thing of the past. And in fact, they doubled down by removing the headphone jack on their iPhone 7s that very same year, a thing that a bunch of Android phone manufacturers teased Apple about at first, only for them to do the exact same thing in a few years. Then in 2017, Apple said to themselves, we already took away their ports. What else can we take from them? Oh, I know, let's remove the function keys and instead give them a touch bar. They'll think that they're getting something that is new, improved, and futuristic, when in reality, they're getting software buttons, which are way less reliable than physical hardware ones. So, RIP your function keys, man. And then, if we take a look at 2020, Apple introduced the M1 architecture, which is pretty damn good as far as performance and battery life goes in a laptop, but it also killed Linux support and even support for running Windows on a MacBook, further locking you down into the walled garden of Apple's ecosystem, which is probably what I hate the most about Apple. Well, besides them not wanting to let customers repair their own products, uh, I really hate the walled garden. Like, don't get me wrong. The hardware that Apple makes is pretty solid. Okay, six years ago, if you told me that you wanted the best laptop that money could buy, I probably would have told you to look at the MacBook Pro, install Linux to it uh, if you don't like the Mac OS, and you can hit the ground running. But if I'm forced to use an operating system that I don't like, then the hardware really has no value to me. Like I'm not going to enjoy the experience uh, of using this. You know, it's pretty much just an expensive paperweight. Well, a couple of days ago, Apple revealed the 2021 MacBooks. And so far, the hardware looks very impressive to me. So the IO is a lot less stupid. It is still missing a regular USB connector, which I think is really dumb, but you do at least get your HDMI port back and your SD card slot, which is important if you're doing creative work, which is always what I feel like the MacBook Pros have really been marketed towards, the people that are doing you know, photo editing, video editing, things like that. Uh, you also get the MagSafe 3 port back, so we've got the cool power connector again, and three Thunderbolt 4 ports. And I guess at least one of those is going to serve as your USB port if you know, you use an adapter for things like flash drives, which you've probably already bought if you're a MacBook fanboy because you've been spending the last half decade in USB-C hell. The physical function keys are finally back as well, so no more getting stuck in full screen programs when the touch bar decides to die on you. Uh, the internals are also really, really nice. So the M1 processors have been really beefed up. If we take a look at the M1 Max SKU, which as the name implies is the maxed out highest spec MacBook uh, that is coming out this year, it has a 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU, and a 16 core neural engine. And we can also get up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory which is really interesting because this unified memory can be used as regular RAM 
and VRAM, effectively giving the GPU component of the M1 Max chip more memory than any other mobile GPU and even more than most high-end workstations. Uh, this unified memory is also supposed to have a maximum bandwidth of 400 gigabytes a second on the M1 Max chip, which is on par with current gen laptop GPUs. Uh, also, due to the difference in the M1 architecture, that data doesn't need to be copied from the CPU to the GPU, which I would expect to give it an advantage over an Intel NVIDIA or AMD setup. Also, if we look at the Geekbench results for the M1 Max uh, MacBook Pro, the multi-core score is only slightly behind the Mac Pro 2019 with a 12-core uh, Xeon processor in it, and the M1 actually outperformed Apple's 2019 desktop in single-core performance which is pretty crazy. Like it usually takes many years before laptops can start keeping up or even surpass higher end desktops uh, from a few years ago. But Apple's M1 chips, they're just built different. Now these high numbers on Geekbench are cool and all, but what we're really going to care about, what really matters is performance in different applications like video editing applications, 3D rendering, uh, compiling large programs, dealing with large photo editing projects that have many, many layers to them. You know, the real world benchmarks uh, that people who do actual work actually care about. We don't really have a lot of that stuff yet. Uh, all we really have are Geekbench and Apple's not very well detailed benchmarks, which of course uh, are going to look really good because they came from the manufacturer. So definitely keep an eye out for more detailed independent benchmarks with the programs that you will actually be using or you know compiling benchmarks like how long it takes to compile Chromium uh, or even the Android operating system itself, uh, which I think would be a fair benchmark to do on something like this. I think that this laptop would actually be able to handle that. But yeah, keep an eye out for a better test if you really want to buy one of these. Now for the bad news. GNU slash Linux still doesn't work on Apple's new M1 chips. And as far as I know, nobody has gotten Linux to work very well natively on any M1 chips besides the M1 Mac Mini. Now, there is work that's being done on this in the Linux kernel. In fact, that was one of the major details in the release notes for kernel version 5.13 is starting to standardize patches for M1 hardware. But since only one device with M1 hardware can run GNU slash Linux natively, there's obviously a whole lot more work that has to be done. There's last generation's MacBooks and now the, this generation. Uh, and like I said earlier, I'm not really even interested in a Mac if I'm forced to use Mac OS on it. Uh, the new MacBooks are also not really any more repairable or upgradable than they have been since 2016. We already know that they don't have regular DDR RAM like other laptops, uh, but they don't have regular hard drives that you can just buy and put in yourself either. So you're pretty much forced to decide how much onboard storage you want to buy um, or you want to have when you purchase it. And obviously Apple is going to charge you an arm and a leg for it, right? Like if we just take a look on their website here, it's $400 if you want to add uh, just one extra terabyte of storage and then $600, right? So actually a thousand in total if you want to add three more terabytes of storage. And we're not even going to talk about if you want eight terabytes of storage. So this is pretty ridiculous. You're paying like $5,000 for a maxed out laptop. You would think that at the very least, Apple would just let you buy secondhand storage and then put it in yourself. I also bet that this onboard storage isn't going to be much faster or even as fast as some of the higher end uh, M.2 PCIe drives. And also at this price, when we're talking about uh, $4,000, or especially when we're talking about just over $6,000, you're looking at building a Threadripper desktop at this point. Even with the inflated prices of CPUs and GPUs right now, 
um, you would still definitely be getting a better bang for your buck. Now, obviously a Threadripper workstation isn't portable, but just how portable does a computer that is this powerful need to be? I bet the majority of people uh, whose workloads actually require this much power, they're going to be doing most of their work at a desk. Okay, especially these higher workloads uh, with the Mac connected to a dock that's then connected to multiple monitors. But hey, maybe there's a few people out there that just really like doing 3D rendering on a train uh, for the short while that their laptop can actually carry that workload on battery life, which is another thing that I'm very interested in is what does the battery life of this thing actually look like? under load because the M1 are supposed to be optimized not just for performance, but for battery life as well. Uh, but like I said before, no tucks, no bucks, which means until the M1 actually supports GNU Linux, I'm not really going to be that interested in it. But let me know down below what you think about the M1 MacBook and be sure to leave a like on the video to hack the algorithm and have a nice rest of your day.